Everyone, uh, can you hear me okay? We're gonna finish up what we wanted to cover on Friday for A-B testing. And then we'll just, that's just gonna be today's lecture. We're not gonna really go too much into causality. Um, we're just gonna do causality after the midterm actually. Uh, but everything on today's lecture will be on the midterm. And um, we'll just kind of make sure we get through everything. And we'll wrap, we'll I'll also talk a little bit more about p-values because there's still some questions about that. So we'll kind of wrap that up too. Um, so a few announcements today. Um, homework assignments to Thursday, third and Wednesday for bonus points. Of course, we have the midterm this Friday. Um, we have you know information and logistics about the midterm. And we've also updated the prep guide with a review session video. So I encourage you to check that out as well. And um, the most important announcement is to please try the online practice exam before Friday. So um, the way that you're gonna be taking the exam on Friday, just make sure that you have that all set up and working properly. And so you can test that out beforehand by trying out this practice exam. So it's a good way for you to practice some questions, but also actually just make sure you have the right setup. So please, please do that. And let us know if there's some issues and you're not able to run it properly. We can get it sorted out before Friday. Cool, so uh, back to A-B testing. So, you know, so far we had talked about how We've seen examples where there's like one sample typically, and you know, we had like the Alabama jury or the Alameda County jury or Mendel's P plants or the GSI's exams. It was on all those cases, it was kind of one sample that we were interested in. And we we're trying to understand something about the population that the sample was drawn from. And so in this case, we're actually gonna be talking about two different samples from two different groups. And we wanna understand something, some parameter about each of the populations that they come from. And the basic question is, do the values that we're seeing for each of these samples, do they actually come from the same distribution? Um, and then we're gonna answer this using a technique called A-B testing. So just to kind of recap what we went over, um, we had just started talking about this data set. So it contains a bunch of rows where each row corresponds to a baby that was born. And we have some variables about each baby. So we have like, like what was their weight when they were born, um, the number of gestational days, what was the age of the mother, um, the height of the mother, and then the weight of the mother um, just before delivery and whether the mom smoked or not. So this is kind of the main data set that we we're working with for this example. And we decided that we wanted to mainly look at the main variables we were gonna care about here was gonna be birth weight, so the weight of the baby, and whether the mom smoked. So we took our table of births and we just selected paternal smoker and birth weight. And then we added that um, into a new table called smoking and birth weight. So that would, that's a table that just has those two columns. And then we said, we wanted to know how many of these babies had moms who smoked versus who didn't. So we were able to answer that question using group. So we just took smoking and birth weight dot group Eternal smoker, and then that automatically counts up the number of times each unique value appears. So maternal smoker only has two unique values. It's either true or false. And so um, it's false 715 times in this data set, and it's true 459 times. So most of the most of the moms did not smoke, but a pretty substantial portion did. And our basic idea is that now we're basically thinking of these two as the two groups we're interested in. So we're interested in moms who smoke and moms who don't. And then we want to know whether the distribution of the weights of the babies um, is the same for both of those groups of um, moms. And so one way to kind of just take a look at how it looks, at least in the sample, is to plot a histogram. So that's what we did next. So we said, Let's plot a histogram of the birth weights. So the weights of all the babies grouped by whether the mom smokes or not. So that's what we did here. And so in, in blue, we see this histogram. This is the birth weights of the babies from mothers who do not smoke. And then the gold histogram, which is kind of on top of it is the histogram of the birth weights of babies coming from mothers who do smoke. And so we can see here is that this gold histogram looks like it's a little bit shifted over to the left, um, indicating probably that the 
birth weights of the babies who, of the mothers who smoke is a little bit less um, than those who do not. But again, we said how this is just a sample. So we just took a sample of some mothers, some who smoke, some who do not. And we're trying to make a conclusion about the entire population of all mothers and all babies. And so, you know, we might've just by chance happened to select a bunch of babies from women who smoke, who just happen to be lighter, because that's certainly possible. Um, but the idea is, you know, is that difference, this difference that we're seeing, is this due to chance alone, or is there actually some systematic difference in the birth weights of babies coming from mothers who smoke? That's the basic question we're trying to answer. And so visualization of just our sample isn't quite enough. That's why we need to use hypothesis testing. So I'll start really quickly with some questions. Um, what is group equals? So when you draw a histogram of your data, you could just call hist and then pass in the column that you wanna draw a histogram of, but you can also group it by another column. And so if you do that, then it's gonna do multiple histograms for each unique value in whatever column you pass here. So in this case, we pass maternal smoker that has two unique values. So that's why I drew two histograms. So basically said, draw a histogram of all the people where maternal smoker is false, and then also draw a histogram of all the people where maternal smoker is true and just overlay on top. All right, so that's how we, that's kind of the main setup for what we're trying to do. And then when we're doing, we're gonna to have to answer this using a hypothesis test. And so when we do that kind of, you know, the first step is to figure out, okay, what's your null, what's your alternative? And then also figure out what is um, your test statistic. So it, it, what, what do you think the null and the alternative might be in this case? Any thoughts on any ideas? Yeah, so the null is essentially there's no difference, but if we want to make that really clear in terms of, you know, some some type of chance model, we would say that the distribution of the weights of the babies is the same for both of these groups. Um, and then the alternative is that no, they're not. Um, there's actually a difference there. Um, you could be even more specific and say the alternative is um, that the weights of the babies from women who smoke is actually less than the weights of the babies who do not. So kind of depends on the context of the problem. Um, and so we're essentially gonna be comparing these two groups and then, you know, questions could difference between chance alone. And so these are the hypotheses we're gonna go with. So we're gonna say in the population. So again, your hypothesis is pretty much always about the population. So that's one thing that's really important. It's not about the sample because the sample is just what we observed. We're trying to make a conclusion about the entire population. And we'd love to get, you know, every single baby in the world, every single mom in the world, but that's not feasible. So we're gonna to try to make a conclusion about that population using your sample. So in the population, the distributions of the birth weights of the babies in the two groups are the same. And the only reason basically they're different in the sample is due to chance. So that's kind of the null hypothesis. And then in our case, for all, our alternative, we're gonna be pretty specific. So we're gonna say in the population, the babies of the mothers who smoke weigh less on average than the babies of mothers who do not smoke. So that's the difference here. Um, but one quick one, someone asks, why is the number so high for the birth weights? Like they're in the hundreds. Um, so I believe that's grams, not pounds. So that's why it's like 180, it's not pounds. Um, or ounces, yeah, maybe ounces, sorry. Um, all right, so yeah, so again, really important your kind of hypotheses are always about the population. So that's that's a super critical. And most of you guys got it like spot on. So basically no hypothesis is that distribution of the weights the same. Alternative is no, actually the mothers who smoked weight less on average. Um, so now we have a very specific alternative hypothesis. And so the next step is to come up with a test statistic that would help us um, you know, show whether there's evidence in favor of the alternative or not. Um, and so our specific test statistic, what we're going to use is we have group A that's non-smokers, group B that's smokers. So our statistics is going to be the difference between the average weights of the two groups. So we're going to do um, the weights of the smokers, the babies of the smokers, 
average of that minus the average of the weights of the non-smokers. So that's going to be our test statistic. And because of the way this is designed, um, negative values of the statistic favor the alternative. So, you know, if the weight of the babies uh, from people who are smoking is a lot less than the non-smokers, then this difference is going to actually be negative. Um, if it was a lot more, then the difference would be positive. So that's also really important. So now we know that negative values of the test statistic favor the alternative, um, which means that when we do end up finally simulating this a bunch of times and drawing our histogram, it means that you know the more farther out to the left our observed statistic is, the more likely we are to um, reject the null, be more in favor of the alternative. So more values to the left is going to be more evidence for um, the alternative. So could you? One question is, could you do the absolute difference? So in this case, we wouldn't want to do the absolute difference because we talked about how when you take the absolute difference then you're going to have that both really negative values and really positive values are evidence for the alternative. And in that case, this isn't what we want because the alternative isn't saying that they're different. The alternative in this case we specifically said is that one group is a lot less than the other, weighs a lot less than the other. So because there's a specific direction there, then you don't want to take the absolute value. So you should only be taking absolute value when the alternative is that the two groups are different. And that's all you're saying. You're not saying anything more specific than that. Um, why aren't we using TVD? So with TVD, you use that when you're trying to compare the distribution of the categories of two different groups, right? So if you're trying to compare like the distribution of ethnicities in a panel from like one, like your sample to your population, that's when you'd use TVD. In this case, we're not comparing the distribution of the categories. We're actually comparing a numerical value. We're comparing the weights of the babies. So because we're comparing weights of the babies within each of the two groups, that's why we're going to use um, the difference of the averages, just slightly different here. Um, whereas in the Alameda jury case, we didn't really care about anything specific about each of the ethnicities. We were just looking at what's the proportion of all the panel that's in each ethnicity. In this case, we're going kind of like a layer deeper. So we have these two different groups, smoker and non-smoker. Those are certainly categories, but within those categories, we're looking at a numerical value within each category. So that's why this is a little bit different. Um, and another question, really good question. Can you do group A minus group B? You can certainly do that as well. You just need to keep in mind that if you do that, that means that really positive values um, of the statistic favor the alternative, but that's totally fair too. Either one would be actually fine here. So just that, that's arbitrary, B minus A or A minus B, but just you need to remember like which one corresponds to like positive values in favor of the alternative, which one corresponds to negative values. All right, so let's actually calculate our observed test statistic because we have our observed data. So we can just calculate this. Um, so let's first calculate the averages um, of each of the groups. So we're going to put this in a table called means table, and then we'll do smoking and birth weight dot group. So we're going to use group to do this. Um, so we pass in maternal smoker because that's what we want to group by. And then we don't just want to count up the number of people that's in each group. We want to take the average of the other column that's there, which is birth weight. So if we call it like this, I'll just put this on a new line so you can see it all together. Um, that's going to take each of the unique values, true and false, and then just calculate the average birth weight because birth weight is the only other column um, in this in this table. And then it's going to put that all together for us. So we can take a look at what this shows. So here we have the unique values, false and true, and then we have the average value of all the other columns for each of these unique values. In this case, there's only one other column. So we just get the average birth weight for false, average birth weight for true. And so you can see here right away that um, the average birth weight for true is about 10 ounces less than average birth weight for false. So there's a big difference there. Um, and then now we have, now that we have like each of the means, we can just calculate the difference. So, um, we can just do, let's say, let's just take the means column. So we do means equals means table of column one. So let's just take this second column here and put that into an array called means. And then the observed difference is gonna be means item one minus means item zero. And then we can just 
take a look at what the actual observed difference is. So it's actually not exactly 10, it's a little bit less than 10, but it's basically negative 2.66. So this is gonna be our observed difference. And again, we said that um, more negative values of this is gonna be more evidence for the alternative. So negative 2.66, seems pretty negative, but we don't know what that means. Like maybe negative 2.66 actually isn't that large. Um, so we need, now we need to understand, okay, how large is this? What we observed is it's negative, but how negative is this? Like, what does that mean? Is this a large value or is this a small value? Um, so we need, in order to do that, we're gonna need to simulate um, from the null. Um, why did we turn only one column into an array? So we just wanted to calculate the difference between these two values here and this column. So that's why we just took both of the values in that column um, and assigned it to means. So means just contains 123 and 113. And then we just said we wanted the difference of the two. So. Cool. So we're going to eventually find a way to simulate a bunch of examples of this. We're going to find a way to simulate um, you know, a bunch of people who, um, a bunch of babies who have come from mothers who smoked and a bunch of babies who have come from mothers who have not smoked. And then we're gonna calculate the difference and we're gonna do that like 2000 times. That's kind of the standard process here. Um, and so because we're gonna be taking the difference of these two groups, these two like simulated babies again and again, uh, it'd be really helpful to make a function for this. Um, and so we're gonna actually make a function for this called difference of means. So I've already written out here, but we'll just kind of go over it together. Um, so to start, we're going to call this difference of means, and it's going to take in a table, um, which is going to be kind of the table that has the, the, the weights of the babies or the simulated babies. Um, and then we're going to have label, and that's going to be kind of the name of the numerical variable. So like birth weights in this case, and then we're going to have group label, which is going to be the label of the group level uh, label. So that's um, going to be smoking in this case. So you need to pass in a table, specify which column in the table is the one where you have the numerical values that you're gonna be taking the difference of means of, and then which one has the name of the column that's the category that you're comparing between. And then it's gonna return the difference of means of the two groups. So basically it's gonna calculate the average value of um, the numerical variable in each of the categories, and then return the difference of the averages. And so what are we gonna actually do in this um, function, difference of means? So first of all, um, we're gonna do kind of what we just did above. So we're gonna first create um, a name called reduced and it's gonna have um, the stuff that's in table, but only with the two, two columns that we care about. So the numerical variable and the categorical variable essentially. Um, so we're just gonna have those two columns in there. So that's just be assigned to reduced. Then we're gonna do what we just did, which is we're gonna create a means table, which is just gonna be reduced. And then we're gonna group by the categorical variable. Um, we did it for smoking. And then what are we gonna do? When you group it, we're gonna take the average of whatever else is in the table. In this case, there's only gonna be one other column in the table, which is the numerical value. So then once we do that, we're gonna do the same thing once again, um, take the column one. So column at index one is the second column. And that's just like the numerical uh, averages. Now we have both of the averages for each category in one array. Finally, we can just return um, the second value minus the first value. So this is basically doing the same process we just did above, but just putting it into a function so that we don't have to keep writing like these four lines again and again. Um, so this is gonna just make things a little bit more efficient. So any questions about this function? What's the difference between label and group label? So label is gonna be the numerical variable that we care about. Um, and then group label is gonna be the categorical variable that we're calculating the difference between. So the whole point of this function is, it's kind of this generic function where if you pass in a table and you specify which numerical value that you wanna calculate the averages of, and then which category you wanna calculate the averages between, it will then um, automatically return the difference in the average value of the numerical variable between the two categories. So that's what it's doing here. So essentially, yeah, this function is general enough that you could use like 
any category. We could use any numerical variable in our um, in our table actually. So like I could calculate the difference in like average maternal age between smokers and non-smokers or the difference in maternal height between smokers and non-smokers. So it's a very generic function that we could pass in like any variable we want. Um, and um, how do we know which value comes first and second? So we know in our case that um, false and true are gonna be listed alphabetically like this. So true would be the second one. And that's the one that we wanted to subtract. Uh, we wanted to do true minus false. So that's why we know that's gonna be many means that item one minus means that item zero. So I'm just gonna run this line of code. So now we have the function defined and then we can actually use it on our table. So we could do a difference of means, births, pass in birth weight because that's the numerical variable we wanna calculate the averages of. And then we wanna calculate this average between um, different values of maternal smoker. So this is how we can call the function and we get the same value we got above, negative 2.66. So this function is working as expected. Um, and so when we do our simulation, we're gonna call this function many, many times. And we're always gonna pass in these two things as the last two arguments. It's always gonna be birth weight and maternal smoker. The only thing that's gonna change is the table that has the birth weights in them. Because in our simulation, each time we're gonna simulate a bunch of babies um, and their weights. So this is gonna change up every time in the simulation. But these two are gonna be the same because we always wanna do it on birth weight and maternal smoker. Um, so one question is, since the value we got is negative, is that enough to reject the null? So again, we don't really know if that's enough because we need to simulate assuming that the distributions are the same. Because just by chance, you could all, maybe it's possible that by chance you'd get a difference of negative 2.66. Like even if the distribution of the babies is exactly the same, if you randomly sample some babies that come from smokers and some that do not, you're gonna get some difference there. Like every single time you, you draw some, you're gonna get some differences there. So sometimes the difference in the means is gonna be positive, sometimes it'll be negative, sometimes it'll be really close to zero, sometimes it'll be far from zero, but we don't really know yet how far away from zero those values will tend to be. So we need to simulate always to actually assess the magnitude of this uh, observed difference and how large it really is. We don't really know if it's large or not. Um, so yeah, and this is a difference of nine, negative 9.266, okay. Um, all right. So now that we have our test statistic, we need to figure out how do we actually simulate from this data set? Um, how do we simulate from this population? Um, so again, our null distribution, our, our null hypothesis says that the um, distributions of the baby weights is the same, regardless of whether um, the mom smoked or not. So in some ways, what that means is it shouldn't even matter if their mom smoked or not. Like the, the distribution of the weights is going to be the same regardless of that label. Um, and so here, this is kind of a visual representation of the data that we have. So we have this first baby, their mom did not smoke, they weighed 120 ounces. Then we had another baby, their mom did not smoke, they happened, the baby happened to weigh 113 ounces. Then we had another baby, the mom did smoke, happened to weigh 128 ounces and so on. So this is just one way we can visually represent all the babies. Um, and so the idea is, you know, we're trying to simulate under the null hypothesis. Ideally, we'd like to be able to go out and be able to, you know, sample some new babies, um, but we can't really just do that. So we just have this data that we have and we need to somehow be able to simulate the null is true with the data that we have. Um, so we just have these babies, we have to do something with them. And um, again, we said that it, if, the null is true, that means that the distribution of the weights is the same um, for both of these. So that means that basically the label doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter whether you're a smoker or a non-smoker. Um, it should, your the distribution of the weights of the baby should be basically the same. And so if that's the case, that means that what we could do is we could just shuffle the labels around. And that could be one way to simulate a brand new set of babies. So notice now after we shuffled it, the first baby now has been attached to a mom who is a smoker. They've, they're being considered as their mom being a smoker, even though they weren't. So if we just shuffle the labels around, that's one way we can actually simulate under the null hypothesis. 
Because again, under the null hypothesis, it doesn't even matter whether you, your mom smoked or not. Your, just, your weight should be basically the same as it was before. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do essentially. That's how we're gonna actually simulate 2000 times um, from this um, data set of babies. So one person asked, why do we shuffle them randomly rather than just swapping non-smokers to smokers? So if you, if you just swap non-smokers to smokers, that would just create one other um, simulation. And then you wouldn't be able to do any more simulations at that point. So we wanna be able to create like thousands of different simulations, right? So that's why we just wanna randomly shuffle them around. Cause when you randomly shuffle them around, there's like millions of different combinations that you can have of babies and smoker or non-smoker. And that's what we wanna do. Um, one person said, shouldn't we use a 50-50 chance on each person being smoker or non-smoker? We can't do that because the number of um, smokers and non-smokers is not 50-50 in this data set. If you remember, it's about 700 people who did not smoke and like 400 people who did. So you can't use 50-50. Um, so we're just gonna we're just gonna want to shuffle all of them. That way, we have the exact we're guaranteed to have the exact same number of smokers and non-smokers as our original example. Because remember, we want to simulate something that's like as close to um, what we had originally. We just mainly want to change up the values of the weights and the average value of the weights. That's really what we're trying to simulate is how does the average value of the weights jump around um, from simulation to simulation? Cool, can you see the code for shuffling? Great question, yes you can, we're gonna do that right now. All right, so how do we actually shuffle? Um, yeah, how do we actually do this? So we're gonna do something called random permutation. And so we've already seen shuffling actually so far in this class. So we've done things like we've taken a table and um, you know we've sampled like the first, or sampled like n times from it. So you can take um, a table of n rows and then just pick randomly with replacement. Um, and then you can also just take the entire table and just sample it. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna return a table with the same number of rows as your original table, but picked randomly with replacement. Um, so main distinction here is in the first case, you could have a table with like a thousand rows, but maybe you just want to sample like four things from it. So that's what, that's when you would do table that sample and then pass in four. Um, whereas in this case, if you just do table that sample, if you have a table with a thousand rows, it's going to return a new table with a thousand rows that have been randomly picked from your original table, but it's with replacement. So the way it's going to work is it's going to go through, pick a random row, stick it in the new table, but then put it back also into this original table for the next sampling, and then do that a thousand times. So you can have repeated rows essentially if you do it this way. Um, and then if you don't want to have repeated rows, um, you can do table that sample, but then specify with replacement equals false. And so if you do table that sample with a specific number, like let's say you did four, then it would pick four values without replacement. So it's gonna take four values out without putting any of them back in. Um, and so that's what that's gonna do. And then if you don't pass in an actual number here, it's just gonna sample the entire table without replacing anything back. And that's how we shuffle. So this last one is actually how we shuffle. So if you have a table of a thousand rows, it's gonna pick a thousand rows randomly from that, but in like essentially a random order. And you're guaranteed to make sure each row from the original table only shows up one time and exactly one time in um, this new table. So there have been situations where we want to do with replacement. There have been situations where we don't want to do with replacement. Um, you know, like when we went and talked about the very first example of probability, and we were talking about those three cards that we had, we had like an ace and a king and a queen, and we were drawing a card from them. And we, were, we were actually drawing two cards from those three. That was actually a case of sampling without replacement because we drew the first card and then we, then we had two cards left. We didn't like put the card back in and then draw another card. Um, you drew the first card, now you have two left, then you draw randomly from that again. So that was a case of without replacement. Um, another question is, why don't we want uh, N rows? So if you don't specify N, that's basically when you wanna sample the entire table again. Um, there's some situations where you don't wanna do that, where you just wanna maybe take like a subset, you just wanna sample like a few rows. But in our case, we're trying to shuffle all of the labels, all of the rows. So that's why we're gonna use this last function.
Um, oh, this is a good question. Someone said, why can't we just do np.random.choice, smoker, non-smoker, or like sample proportions essentially, and then just add that to the, add that as like a new array of new labels. So the thing, the problem with that is you're, you're not gonna be guaranteed to have the same breakdown of smoker and non-smoker if you do that. Like by chance, you might have like way more smokers. What we wanna do is we wanna simulate the exact setup of our, of our sample. So we wanna simulate like exactly whatever that number was, like 700 um, non-smokers. Let's go actually up to that number uh, right here. So we wanna simulate a bunch of times um, a set of babies such that 715 of them come from mothers who are non-smokers and 459 come from mothers who are smokers. It's really important that we simulate with this exact same breakdown. Um, and so that's why we're just gonna use sampling the entire table with, without replacement. Um, because that guarantees that we have the exact same number of labels are just shuffled around. So it's just a safer way to do it. The reason that we need this to be the exact same is because we're trying to understand whether this difference here that we saw negative 9.266, is that weird? Is that really large? Is that really negative? Or is that something that you would expect to see? So if you're trying to assess whether this is something we would expect to see, we need to simulate things under the exact same conditions. So we need to make sure we have exactly these numbers here. If we don't have the same numbers, then we're not simulating under the same conditions. And so then the distribution of what can come up is gonna be very different. Um, so we're trying to really simulate our test statistic under the exact same conditions. So that's why it's really important to just sample. Um, does the number of smoker and non-smoker change when you shuffle? No, it doesn't because we're specifically taking the entire table and then just recreating it, but with the rows shuffled around. So we're not taking any new rows. No rows are gonna appear twice. Each row will appear exactly one time, just like it did originally, but it's just gonna be in a different spot now, that's it. So we're, we're actually 100% guaranteed to have the exact same number of smokers and non-smokers. So let's actually see some examples of how this works. So um, I've created a table here, it's called staff. Um, and so it has two columns, whoops, sorry. It has two columns, so it has names. So these are the names of our staff. And then it has ages, um, which is the age of each person in the staff. So let's just run this. And then let's actually go through the examples of the different sampling functions that we have. So firstly, we could do staff.sample. So if we run this, um, this is gonna take our entire table and then sample the same length of the table. So we have four rows in this table. It's gonna do, let's actually just look at the table before I do that actually. So this is the original table. And then if I just call sample, it's gonna take, it's gonna create a new table with the same number of rows. So four rows, and it's gonna sample them um, with replacement. So in the first case, it, it picks Jim, but then it puts Jim back in. And then for the next one, it samples one person randomly from these four again, and it happens to pick Pam, then it puts Pam back in. So that's sampling with replacement. Um, and then if you wanted to sample, like let's say just two of them, we could do that as well. So we could do like two with replacement. So here we get two different people, but if I run this enough times, um, we'll probably get like two of the same people. Um, but this is sampling two people with replacement. So it's the same thing that we did above, but it's just two people. Um, and then if we wanted to sample without replacement, which is what we want to do, we would just call staff.sample and then do with replacement equals false. And so now we get a random sample of four people from this original table, but without replacement. What that means is we're guaranteed to get all of the same people again. Um, and there's no duplicates here. Whereas when we did it up here, we got pan three times because we sampled with replacement. So this guarantees that we had the exact same number of people that we're gonna sample um, as originally. And um, this is sampling age as well. So this is actually sampling the entire row. So that's one thing, other thing to keep in mind. So this is sampling the entire row. So Jim and 29 are like together. So it's just that entire row has been chosen. Um, so that's how sample works. It picks the entire row. Um, and so let's say that we wanted to um, just shuffle the names, but keep the, uh, the ages like the same. So we could do that. So if we wanted to just shuffle the names, what we could do is we could do staff.sample with replacement, um, but then just keep the first column. So now we have a way to shuffle just the names. I can run this again. 
now we have slightly different ordering of the names. And then if I wanted, I could even add this like back into the table. So I could do staff with column and then essentially add a new column here. Um, and we could call this like shuffled. And so now if we call this, we have our original table, but then we also have this new column shuffled, which is just the name shuffled. Um, that's really uncanny. It, it got the exact same order. So let's actually try this again. All right, so now we got slightly different order here. And then we can run it again, slightly different order here in the third column. So this is essentially how we could take our original table and just shuffle the names um, and just move them around, but still keep the ages where they are. Um, why did we do column zero? We did column zero because we just wanted the column of the names. So we just wanted to shuffle the names. We didn't really care about shuffling the ages in this case. So that's why this, this line here actually shuffles the entire table, but we just want to shuffle the first column. So that's why we just picked the first column. Um, if you remove column, I believe this will error because you're trying to add a table into one column, which doesn't make sense. So I think if you don't have this, it's gonna throw an error. So bringing this back to our example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna shuffle the smoker and non-smoker. That's what we're gonna shuffle. So we're gonna keep the weights exactly where they are in the table, but we're just gonna shuffle up the smokers and non-smokers. So again, why, why, would, why is this valid? So under the null hypothesis, we said that the distribution of the weights is the same, regardless of whether a smoker or non-smoker. That basically means we could shuffle around whether a baby comes from a smoker or not. Um, and that's a way to kind of simulate from this null hypothesis. Um, and so this is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna shuffle, shuffle all of the group labels. So that's smoker, non-smoker. Then we're gonna assign the shuffle label back to the birth weight. And then we're gonna find the difference between the averages of the two shuffle groups. So every time we shuffle, we're gonna have like a different set of you know babies now who have been assigned to smoker and non-smoker. And then once you have that, you're gonna calculate the difference in the means between the two categories. And so that difference in means should jump around quite a bit because we're just shuffling the labels around. And then we'll just repeat this like many, many times. All right, so let's actually simulate under the null. So let's take a look at our actual sample again. So again, this is kind of the main table that we care about now is just this two column table. So it has maternal smoker, it has the weight of the babies. Um, and so the first step, I'm just gonna write this out. So step one is gonna be shuffle the table and take out the smoker column. Because again, we just want to shuffle. We just want to shuffle the smoker column. That's all we care about shuffling around. So we'll do kind of like what we just did with the staff example, and then just pick the first column. So let's call these shuffled labels, and it's going to contain smoking and birth weight dot sample with replacement. I'm just going to put this on a new line actually. So with replacement equals false. So we get the entire table once again but just in a random order. And then we just wanna pick the first column. So we're doing the exact same thing. We basically just did the staff example. So if we run that, now we have a um, new permutation of all of the smokers. All right. And so now um, step two is gonna be that now we've shuffled the labels. What we're gonna do is just add the shuffled smoker column um, into the original table. We can kind of just see it all side by side. So again, this is something that we just did with the staff table as well. So let's call this new table original and shuffle. And then it's gonna have our original table with column. And then what's the column gonna be? Let's just call it shuffle label. And then it's gonna have the shuffled labels. And then we can take a look at that. And so here's one, again, we've only shuffled one time so far. So we're just seeing an example of that. And so here we did one shuffle label. And so we can see like this first baby went from having a non-smoker to a smoker. Second baby stayed the same. Third baby stayed the same. Um, these, these few babies down here all switched. 
So you can see how it like changes up a little bit now. Um, so let me just make sure any questions about we, what we just did so far with these two steps here. Um, why didn't we use drop in step one? Oh, that's a good question actually. So um, after we sampled the entire table, why didn't we use drop? So when you use drop, it just takes a, a column out, but it still returns back a table. Because when you use drop, it takes your table, takes a specific column out, and then returns another table that's like smaller. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to actually get the column itself because we wanted to store the column in here. We didn't want to store a table. So that's why we did column zero rather than like drop the other thing. Um, All right, and then so now that we have the original and the shuffled, let's actually calculate the difference of means of our shuffled labels. So we have that nice function that we made earlier. And then how does it work? We can pass in original and shuffled. We can pass in birth weight because that's the numerical variable that we're gonna care about. But in this particular case, let's actually pass in shuffled label as our categorical group rather than maternal smoker because we wanna see the difference in the shuffled label. So let's actually run this. And so now we get a difference of 0 0.077. So this is a lot smaller in magnitude. It's also a lot more positive um, than the negative, negative 9.266 that we observed. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But of course, you know, that's just one particular simulation that we did. We need to really do a lot of simulations to really verify whether that not negative 9.266 is like really, really negative. Um, because maybe if we do this a lot of times, we might actually see values that are like negative 10 or negative 15. Um, in which case the negative nine that we saw is actually not that crazy. So that's the main thing we wanna um, assess now, at, kind of at scale essentially. So now that we know how to do a single simulation um, from the null hypothesis, we just need to do this several times. And to do this, we're gonna do a permutation test. Um, so this is kind of what it's called. And so we've made a function here to um, do this many, many times. Um, and it's gonna do basically the steps that we just did above. So we're gonna call this one simulated difference. Um, it's gonna take in the same exact arguments actually as the difference of means function. We're just gonna define it the same way. Um, so it's gonna take in a table, the numerical label, and then the categorical label, and then um, the first step is it's going to create an array of shuffled labels. So it's doing what we just did, take your table, sample with replacement false, and then select just the group label column. Um, so in our case, this is going to be like maternal smoker. And then once you have shuffle, a shuffled set of maternal smokers, then you can um, add that into a new table. So we'll call this the shuffled table. And it's going to have table. It's just going to select the numerical value, and then it's going to add in a new column with um, the shuffled label. And then it's gonna return the difference of means um, of the shuffled label essentially. So these are the same kind of three lines that we did up above. And so this is a function to simulate one simulated difference. And then we're gonna do this many, many times to actually get um, you know, several simulated differences. So if I go back up here, actually, this is probably like what I should say is like step three. So step three is calculate the difference in means. So that's kind of the step three. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. So we have the same like three steps here. So like step one, step two, step three. Um, and so now we get to use the new function in a for loop exactly, yeah, that's correct. Um, can you explain the dot select uh, right here? Um, so what this is doing is the shuffle table, it's just gonna take our original table with our data, um, like our original sample, and then just select the numerical um, column. And then, so then this will basically give you a table that has just one column, which is the numerical column. And then we're gonna do that with column shuffle label. So in that way, this shuffled table is gonna just have two columns, our original numerical column and then the new shuffled labels column. So it's just creating a new table with just those two together. And then finally, once you have your new table, which has like your original numerical values and then the shuffled 
um, categorical values, now you can actually calculate the difference in the means between the two. So now we know how to simulate one difference. So let's actually just run it one time. So one simulated difference, and then we're gonna pass in um, births, birth weight, and maternal smoker. So this is gonna simulate another set of babies with maternal smoker shuffled, but birth weight being the exact same. So if we run this, we get a difference of 0.617. We can run this again, we get 0.73, run it again. Now we get negative 0.28, run it again, we get positive 0.37 and so on. So we're able to see how this is kind of moving around a little bit. Um, and then now we'd like to do this in an entire um, simulation. So let's do an actual simulation. So we're gonna store all the results in something called differences. And then we're gonna do for i and np dot a range. Let's do 2,500, so we'll do 2,500 simulations. And then what are we gonna do in each simulation? Well, first we're gonna create, simulate a new difference. So we can just use this line of code here to do that. So I'm just gonna take that, copy it here. Um, and then once you have this, we will then append this to the differences array. So differences equals np.append differences and then our new difference. And so we can run this. This is gonna run 2,500 times. It's gonna calculate a bunch of different uh, differences simulated one, again and again, assuming that the null is true. So assuming that the distribution of the weights is the same, regardless of whether smoker or non smoker. And then finally, once we have everything, um, we can visualize it. So let's put it all into something called diff table. And this is going to be table with column. Um, let's call this difference between group means. And we'll pass in differences. And then we'll do diff table dot histogram. And then I'm just gonna also print out the observed difference so you can compare it. And then we'll do plots.title prediction under the null hypothesis. Okay, so we're about to see our results. One thing actually that we didn't do before we see our results is we didn't decide on a p-value cutoff. Um, so let's, let's for now, let's assume p-value cutoff is 5%. So as we mentioned before, you'll, you'll always know what the p-value cutoff is. So let's say we're gonna go with 5% cutoff. That's gonna be our rule. So if our p-value is less than 5%, we're gonna say that there is a difference in the distributions. Um, the birth weights are, are actually lower for smokers. And if, and if the p-value is larger than that, we're gonna say there's actually no difference. So let's actually now, we've done our simulation, let's take a look at the histogram. Uh, let's see, I did something wrong. Oh, observed difference should have an underscore. Here we go. So our observed difference was negative 9.266. We simulated many times under the null. Let's see what values we got. So it looks like under the null hypothesis, most of the time, the difference in the means between the two groups was like close to zero. Sometimes by chance, you got differences as large as three. Sometimes by chance, you got differences as large as negative three but we never quite saw anything as, as negative as negative 9.266. So again, this is basically saying that the difference that we actually observed in our sample between the weights of the smokers and the non-smokers, that difference um, is significantly more negative than what would actually happen if the null is true. Um, and so that's how we were able to kind of confirm this. And then if we wanted to actually calculate the p-value, I mean, in this case, it's pretty obvious because negative 9.266 is like so far out um, to the left on this histogram, but we could actually calculate the difference um, if we wanted to. So we could do diff table, so we can actually calculate the p-value here. Um, so you could do diff table dot where um, difference between group means r dot below our observed difference. So let me just copy paste this guy. We'll do this over a couple lines. So we can do diff table dot where um, difference between group means is below 
observed difference, because that's kind of the simulations that we care about. How many simulations are actually below our observed value? So once we have that, um, then we can do dot num rows. So how many count up, how many actually are less than what we what we got, and then divide by the total um, number of simulations. And so in this case, we get zero. So the p-value is zero essentially. So the chance of getting something as extreme as what we saw, if the null is actually true, is essentially zero here. Um, and so that's kind of our conclusion in this case would be that um, you know the data is more consistent with the alternative that the weights of the babies um, are gonna be less, or the distribution of the weights of the babies has like an average value that's less than the distribution of the weights of the babies um, that do not smoke. Um, why don't we use np.count non-zero? You can use that as well. It's actually the same thing. Um, so you could do np.count non-zero as well. That's also fine. So the p-value, why is the p-value zero? Um, looking at the histogram, the reason p-value is zero is because, again, remember, the p-value is what percent of your simulations are more in the direction of the alternative than what we saw. So we saw negative 2.66, negative 9. 0.266, that's gonna be like way out on the left. Like it's not even on the graph basically. And all of our simulated values are here. So that means 0% of the simulated values are more negative than negative 9.266. Um, and so the p-value is low, that's favorable towards the alternative. Because p-value means if the null is true, what's the probability of seeing something um, kind of as extreme as what we saw? And so if the probability is like close to zero, that means that essentially we saw something that should be impossible. Um, so if we saw something that should be impossible, that means that the assumption of the null is not correct. Um, Um, yeah, I guess it's one, one person said, is it probably really, uh, zero or is it like close? Is it like probably a little bit more than zero? I mean, we're calculating the probability based on these simulations that we saw the actual probability to getting negative 9.266. It's probably something that's actually non-zero, but it's like almost zero essentially. Um, you'd have to maybe simulate like 10 million times to actually get something like that low. Like it's just probably never going to happen. Um, Okay, so I think I'm going to stop the recording, but we'll stay on for questions.